Hi there, we're back on the 67 Hail Hail channel with me, Hamish Carton, talking about Celtic again. It's Groundhog Day on 67 Hail Hail. We've been here before, but one guy who hasn't been here before, well, not quite literally in terms of this channel, is a Mr Ewan Davidson, the newest member of 67 Hail Hail. Say hello, Ewan. Hello, I couldn't have joined in a better week, could I? I know, I was going to say that, absolutely horrendous. And tell us a little bit about yourself then, you and uh, your love of Celtic, where does it come from? Um, so I was born into a Celtic family, I had literally no choice about it. Um, this would have been about maybe 1995 I started becoming aware of football, so obviously picked the perfect time again. Um, and I believe, if I recall correctly, my first game was a 1-0 win against Hearts in the uh, the year we stopped the 10. So that was, that was pretty good. But I, I think it's a good luck charm. I think it ended there because I don't know what's going on, mate. It's horrendous, isn't it? It's absolutely horrendous. Um, we're going to get on to the topic for today's video, which is uh, an article you've written on 67 Hail Hail. That is going to be your job primarily, is going to be producing written content on the website, along with uh, David Walton and, and John McGinley, who the, the viewers of this channel will know, but you're going to be popping in and helping me from time to time as well. Um, but that's where people can find you. Loads of good content going out there on 67 Hail Hail. What are your overall thoughts in the moment with regards to... Celtic, Neil Lennon, last night, where'd you come down in the whole thing, Ewan? Uh, it was, I think the most disappointing thing about last night was all of it was totally avoidable and it was almost a carbon copy of how we got beat um, at the start of the month. So all the little things that we did wrong then, we did wrong again. And uh, the fact that we're not able to defend corners effectively, I, I think it's been maybe four or five years we've had that problem. And uh, nobody seems to be urgently working on it at all. Um, I thought El Hamid started well, but then kind of faded away, especially for their second goal. I thought we were doing nothing in midfield, despite having a lion's share of possession, which um, I was surprised by. Uh, we had a decent number of shots, it turns out, as well. I don't remember us having many clear-cut chances on goal, apart from, the, obviously, the one we put away. But it's just... it's. Um, it's pretty insipid stuff at the moment. I'm finding it really difficult at the moment because I just feel like I'm banging my head off a wall doing these videos constantly and just nothing's changing. So we're going to kind of deviate from that path today a little bit. Obviously, there's there's still going to be chat over the feelings of, of the club because that's pretty hard to avoid at the moment regardless of what video you do. But we're going to touch on an article that you actually wrote on 67 uh, Hail Hail earlier today. I'm going to tag, the not tag, link the article in the description below so people can read it as well. But basically you took a look at the seven or eight signings that we've made in 2020, so from January until the summer there, and you worked out that we'd spent 17.75 million pounds on transfer fees mm -hmm. and I think you said that we've only got maybe two current starters out of that Yeah, so 17.75 million and our only two regulars uh, are on loan, so that's your headline first of all, um, secondly there's some really useful squad options there you would have thought would be introduced by now, so the likes is Myla Soro, um, David Turnbull obviously suffered after the whole um, Scotland under 21's uh, COVID debacle, but you would have thought he'd be in the team by now. Um, so uh, my main concern, though, is that we've signed an international goalie, and after nine games, five of which he didn't concede, we've immediately chucked him. And uh, yeah, he was a little pop with on wrists against Rangers, but I mean, his his record speaks for itself, and the amount of goals we conceded afterwards has been. Um, it's illustrated pretty perfectly that uh, Barkas wasn't really doing much wrong uh, looking back on it. Yeah, it's uh, the thing I want to kind of, and I probably will reiterate in this video, is that there just seems like no plan with so many of these signings. And for me, that that's probably the most alarming thing is, and we could go through all of these, probably bar, mm -hmm. bar maybe uh, Laxalt and El Yunusi, who are the two who have you know gone into the first team and are performing. What, what was the plan, and I appreciate you're not Neil Lennon, you're not Nick Hammond, you're, if you were Neil Lennon you'd be getting abuse from me right now, so you're probably glad you're not Neil Lennon. But We're all Neil Lennon, you should say that. Exactly. So <laughs> we are all so Neil Lennon, careful. Um, is Mela Soro, <laughs> what, what was the plan there with Mela Soro? Why, like, 
you could look at players in the past that Celtic have signed and you could see a clear plan. Now, it's easy to do it with players who succeeded, but you look at someone like under Brendan Rodgers, like um, Scott Sinclair, who was signed. He came in to improve the first team. You saw the immediate plan there. Moussa Dembele was similar. Even Colo Turi, who wasn't a great Celtic player by any stretch of the imagination, you saw the plan there. It was bringing a bit of experience to a part of the pitch that needed it. You look at so many of the signings we've made over the last year or so, and uh, Ismaila Soro, Patrick Clamal is another one. What was the plan for development of getting those guys into the team? And if there was a plan from Neil Lennon's point of view or Nick Hammond's point of view, why hasn't it materialised? Why has Ismaila Soro played 28 minutes of competitive football for the club? Why has Patrick Clamalla, um, you know, played barely any football since the he was thrown into the derby game against Rangers now I know that there was extenuating circumstances for having to start him against Rangers mm-hmm. but you know what I mean it's just so like stop start it's so scattergun type approach to this whole thing um, and fans find it so frustrating even I'll be in a Yeti at the moment and um, we'll come on to him because that was a, a summer signing obviously and I'll say I'll be in a Yeti he's a good player and I think he's he scored a lot of goals for us and um, we paid 4.5 million pounds for him from West Ham but what's the plan there with him it, it's it's blindingly obvious for any fan looking at him that he's a striker who will play best next to a partner so why are we playing a 4-2-3-1 why is he starting against Motherwell and Hibs but then Edward comes in last night like, it's just mind numbing no, absolutely. Um, and I think Yeti, it throws up a really, like you say, a really interesting kind of tactical question, if you like if you like that side of it. I appreciate a lot of folk don't like getting into the nitty-gritty of tactics and stats and all that kind of thing, but Yeti is not a complete forward. So you would ideally, I mean, I imagine that Neil Lennon, if he's signing off on these transfers, which is another conversation to be had, I think if he picked Yeti out, um, then that would have been to persist with a 3-5-2. Now, obviously, we've gone back to the 4-2-3-1, I think we've signed players not really knowing what shape we would actually play. Um, Diego Laxalt's another example of that. He, I don't know if he's a natural left back. He would have assumed that he would be um, on the left side of the pitch, um, patrolling up and down uh, in a three-five-two shape. But obviously, we've moved back, and he's still playing all right. I mean, he's probably it was a, amongst their best players last night. Although a few covered themselves in glory, it's just um, it's just very confusing to me. Um, I'm under the impression that Neil Lennon signed a lot of these players for a certain system, and now he's had to dramatically change the system back. It's going to leave a lot of these players really struggling for time on the pitch. Remember we went through the phase where Mohamed El Yunusi just wasn't getting a game because the formation we were playing 3-5-2 just didn't suit him. Now that's probably our standout player of the last four to six weeks has been El Yunusi. He's probably on his day maybe other than Edward, the best player at the club or most valuable player, even though he's not technically our player. But we went through a phase where Neil Lennon wasn't even playing him because he was so entrenched in this mindset that he had to play a 3-5-2. And you're totally right, Laxalt was signed as a left wing back. I'd love to go back to the quotes from Lennon when he signed, but I'd be surprised if he didn't mention him as a left wing back. He plays one game against Rangers. I think Milan as well, we started 3-5-2. And then after that, it's gone to, you know... Four two three one. It's just again, it goes back to that lack of planning. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would hope that any top coach, any big team, um, especially a team like ours, would have you know alternative informational plans. Just uh, you know, plans for certain teams, ideas of um, shapes that we can change into mid game if something's not working. But the signings to me don't really point to they, they point to a rigid three five two, especially with Albion Aeti, who have said it's not a complete forward he needs someone next to him and that's no knock on his game that's just I mean I, you could have said the same about Harry Larson's day work better in a pair right that's just the case with him but his actual team selection as opposed to the recruitment policy has been completely against that there are players who should not be starting every game starting every game so if I'm a new arrival it's still like I'm I've got to be looking there and going that was a bit of a Charlie Nicholasism I'm sorry um, <laughs> but I'm sitting there and I'm thinking um how do I get into this team? Especially in the case of someone like uh, like Albion Ayeti, who, by the way, scores a goal every other game, or has done so far this season, which is a pretty that's a pretty remarkable rate of efficiency for a new signing. So I don't know. I really don't. Um, I would like to, just because I've been struggling with it for weeks now. Keeps yeah. me up. Yeah, me too. Um, he he scored a lot of goals at the start of his time at the club, but I think he's I think he's gone. 
seven or eight games now without scoring, um, maybe even longer. I think his last goal was against Hibs prior to the, the hamstring injury he had. Um, so it's a, it's a long time ago, but that comes from being, not having no certainty about his role in the team because some games he's starting a 3-5-2, and then two weeks later, he's starting alone in a 4-2-3-1. And then he's on the bench. And then he's getting 15 minutes. He's not played, I think, more than 75 minutes in any game uh, over the last you know, couple of months. And last night was the first time he didn't get any action at all. So the rest of them's, you know, the rest of those appearances have been stop-start, which is totally frustrating. But for me, the biggest... Well, I say the biggest. There's probably a, a couple of big frustrations that we'll come on to now. And, and one of them is David Turnbull. For me, uh, I know that he's got the issue that you touched on earlier at the moment and he's unavailable, but you know he's been available for the rest of his time at Celtic so far. And for some reason, Lennon hasn't wanted to play him. I think he's played like 60-odd minutes in the league, something like that. He's looked good for the majority of it as well. When he came on at half-time in the win over Hibs, I think it was, he was a breath of fresh air. And I don't understand how the manager doesn't see that and then give him extended opportunities, especially when our probably our weakest area of, well, maybe not because the defence is horrendous, but the second weakest part of the team is that midfield. Like, I just think with the way Scott Brown's playing, if you take him out, and put Turnbull in. I know they're different kind of players, but I just think that Turnbull and McGregor would be a far better centre mid. We're both seeing it. Celtic fans everywhere are seeing it. Why is Neil Lennon not seeing that? To be honest, I've, I've no real clue. He's got this incredible loyalty to Scott Brown, which I understand he is his, he is his captain. But surely, if he wants to start Scott Brown in the big games, David Turnbull can, who's already a proven handful for defences across Scotland, is a prolific player, is an efficient player. Um, can do a lot of the untidy work, but also, you know, he moves well with the ball. Um, he's a kind of, you could compare him to Stuart Armstrong, who I think we hadn't really properly replaced. Um, and as a, to me was, um, you know, getting rid of him went under the radar a little bit because, you know, we haven't really felt the effect of it until now to any great extent. But Turnbull should be starting in the league, no question for me. I think he also, um, he would help uh, McGregor. Um, McGregor's developed more into a sort of kind of roving box to box midfielder, a bit like sort of late twenty Scott Brown in the last couple of years. And no knock on Scott Brown, I, I, I love the guy, I really do, but he is not playing to the required standard at the moment. And if you are going to rely on on him for the presence, you need him for the big games. Fine, but David Turnbull should be playing in the league. Um, and I don't think there's any Celtic fan who would disagree on that. And if there is, I'm sure they're in the comments. So you know, it's fine. I'll see it. Yeah, exactly. They always like to disagree with me, so I wouldn't worry about it. The <laughs> uh, final two we'll touch on, Shane Duffy <clears throat> and Vasilis Barkas. I mean, that's two more absolute disasters, obviously in different kind of ends of the scale in, in terms of the fee shelled out, although we have reportedly paid quite a lot or are paying quite a lot for, for Shane Duffy, but those are two players who certainly Barkas should have been coming into that first team, did come into the first team, both of them, and they've since been bombed out. And again, you just don't see any sort of long-term plan there. It's all just sticking plasters. It's all just from Neil Lennon. Maybe we could change the formation. Maybe we could um, play two up top. Oh, no, we need to play 4-2-3-1. Oh, no, it's the goalkeeper's fault. Oh, no, it's Shane's Duff Duffy's fault, definitely. And then whatever happens, we end up in the same state again. Um, and I'm not saying that either Barkas or Shane Duffy deserve credit for their time in Scotland so far. I think Duffy's been an unmitigated disaster. Yes, yeah. It's clear to see that Shane Duffy is a player who plays best in a team like Brighton who defend their own box and don't have to come out and control the game against teams. But then equally for us against AC Milan in a game that was of that calibre, um, he was found wanting. So it's just a complete mess with Shane Duffy and, and Barkas we've touched on the channel as well. It's just Again, it's just symptomatic of what's going on at the club. Lennon seems so unsure about what his best team, his best formation and his best players are. Hey, what's the upshot here then that we've spent £17.75 million pounds and we've got two players at the moment that are playing in the, the first team and they're both on loan and if they have any sense will not be sticking around post the summer? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of talk about um, being able to convince Diego Lacks out to, to um, commit to Celtic long term. I don't think it'll happen, primarily because... He's an AC Milan player currently. That's his parent club. He'll be looking to go back to AC Milan, who have had a massive resurgence this season, have recruited well, and are looking much better than they have in previous years. Whether how much you attribute that to Zlatan Ibrahimovic and his timeless abilities is never here nor there. 
he'll want to prove himself at AC Milan, or failing that, he'll want to be playing for a club that's playing in the Champions League, um, or at the very least playing in the Europa League, but at a better level than we are. Um, so there's, there's talk of him being swapped for Christopher Ayer, which I think is would be a disaster in its own right. The upshot, yeah, as you, as you say, we've got to either play these players or make a massive loss in them, either in a year or two years, because the reality is, if they're not getting played, their, their value is going to decrease and decrease and decrease, and our model of buying um, buying low and selling high, for example, Moussa Dembele, eventually Odson Edward, um, Stuart Armstrong as well. It's whether we've abandoned that model or we're just not executing it um, to a degree where it's even remotely successful. And um, I really do worry about the future of these of these players because <clears throat> either they get games or they don't, and they will leave if they don't. 